Hallo und herzlich willkommen zum ersten deutschsprachigen Michael Jackson Podcast in The Germany. Mein Name ist Kai und wir Zoom sehe ich Tim. Und wir sind jetzt in der zehnten Anmoderation, aber das macht überhaupt nichts, denn wir haben was richtig <lacht> Cooles äh, für euch heute. Und was ist das denn, Tim? Kannst du uns das ja. mal erzählen? Was ist das denn? Wir haben einen besonderen Gast, einen englischsprachigen Gast. Stellt euch also jetzt auf ungefähr 60 Minuten äh, Englisch ein. Und ich würde sagen, der Gast stellt sich selbst am besten vor. Viel Spaß dabei. This is Jennifer Batten and welcome to the very first German Michael Jackson Podcast. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in Portland, Oregon, in the northwest of America, and the weather okay. is beautiful. It's, we're known for having a lot of rain, so... Yes, of course. The last few weeks have been gorgeous. Well done. So it's summer, I think? It's Yeah. Yes, okay, it yeah. is. Uh, so it's a really great honor for us, and Kai just said uh, we are very nervous, because yes. uh, uh, it's, it's one of those surreal moments for us, of course, Well, uh, I'm about 45 now, and I saw you since my youth. Uh, mm. I didn't saw you live. I saw you just one time in my hometown, and I have to show you this photo of you. Oh, wow. <laughs> you, you won't remember, but it was a great concert uh, with uh, a band. Um, the drummer of the Simple Minds was still there. I don't know the name oh, of sure. the band. I don't yes. either, but I remember the gig. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> okay. But it was a great gig. Um, so thank you very much today. And what some Michael Jackson fans may not even know is that you've played uh, with musicians like Jeff Beck, of course. And I think it's uh, I think he's an idol of you, <laughs> oh, before yes. you. And you were involved by the development of some guitar playing techniques and have released great solo albums yourself. So we will talk about that later, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, my favorite is Momentum <laughs> from oh, the Tribal Rage you. project. Uh, but all of this had its origin a little bit earlier. So all of us have some kind of musical influences or role models. What are your first music memories and influences in your childhood? And what kind of music did you like? Well, I was really lucky because both of my parents were really, really into music. Um, my dad especially was into jazz and must had 2,000 LPs. And when he passed, they, they had turned into CDs and I have them all. And there's probably at least 2,000. Yes. <laughs> um, and my mother played piano and my dad played guitar, although he was a doctor, so it was a it was a hobby for him. But um, gosh, well, in the beginning, it was the monkeys and the Beatles and pop radio and that sort of stuff. But when I hit my teens, my early teens, I don't know how, but I discovered blues and I got into B.B. King, John Lee Hooker, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee. And I would take my allowance and go to the, the basement of record shops. That's where they mm. had what they called cutouts, where it was the discounted records. So I would get yes. a stack of discounted blues records and tie them to my bike and take them home and, and jam in my bedroom. Because once I figured out what those three chords were, I was in heaven. Yes. <laughs> were you like a super fan? Like, for example, me and Tim, we were very like super fans. We had posters in our bedrooms and everything. And we spoke to uh, them. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Now, here, here's a good story for you. Um, there okay. was there was a guy in my small town in upstate New York that went door to door selling Beatles fan club memberships, and I remember when he came to the door, it was so exciting, and my mother said no, and I was horrified, and I stole the money out of her purse and tracked him down, <laughs> and made sure he got the money, and then, uh -huh. you know, being a stupid kid, uh, the poster showed up. And I put the poster on my wall and I never got busted. But the guilt over the years, <laughs> I never did that again. But yeah, I had a, had a Beatles poster above my bedroom and I used to imagine they were hanging out in my room. So your favorite Beatle was? George, because of his eyebrows. I mean, I was okay. eight years old, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or six or something. And he was the guitarist, of course. Yeah. One of them. Yeah. Yes. Do you remember your first guitar? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, my dad bought it for me when I was eight, and it was electric, which is no big deal at this time. But back then, um, in 
the early 60s, I guess, um, you know, it, it, most kids would get acoustic guitars for their first. Mm -hmm. Yes. In part because when you get elected, then you have to get an amp. But my dad mm -hmm. was a player, so he already had an amp, a little Fender Deluxe. Um, and okay. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world because it I didn't know the difference between electric guitars. And to me, it looked like what the Beatles had. And so I was posing to my friends, look at this badass thing I got. In fact, that that ended up in, um, there's a picture of me with it in the Momentum record. Yes. Oh, and the other guys, I, I, I got childhood pictures of them as well yes glenn sobel the drummer who's now with alice cooper he's he's driving his little big wheel as a child <laughs> it's kind of yes. funny yeah yeah i saw that mm. <laughs> so great so was at the time you started to play in in a band god i was very late um in my later teens i i remember i went to a record shop and this is long before the internet and they had developed this Rolodex kind of system with index cards. So all the musicians in the area would write their names and numbers and mm. what bands they were into and what instrument they played. And I thought, wow, I can start a band. So I spent a long time just finding the perfect bandmates. And then I went home and my mother said, you're not going out playing with strangers at night. So that <laughs> whole idea went out the window. And I didn't play with a band until after I graduated Musicians Institute. So I was 21 I think, um, and yeah, very late bloomer. I, I spent all my teenage years just playing in my bedroom. Yes, wow, of okay. course. <laughs> well, what was the band names you, you did before you played for Michael? Um, you remember the names of the bands? Yeah, the, the, the main band that I really cut my teeth with on, on stage was called Pearl, P-U-R-L. And it, it has some meaning that I never remember. <laughs> so it was not the best name. I I was not the founder of the band. I, I kind of came in after they had been formed for quite a while. But w when I joined them, I was really into jazz. And as soon as I joined them, they started doing cover tunes like The, the Police and Pat Benatar. And I mm. showed up for an audition with my Gibson Birdland jazz guitar. And it's amazing. I got the gig because it was not the right guitar for the gig, but um, I think I bought a Strat not long after that. And I stayed with the band for three years. Um, mm -hmm. We did a lot of gigs, mostly fusion, but we also did weddings, which are really difficult. I mean, going yeah, from I know. jazz standards to, you know, fusion to rock pop as the grandparents went to sleep, you know? <laughs> yes, I know. And if the bride isn't satisfy, uh, satisfied, it's all getting more difficult. Uh, well, I haven't done enough to to hate it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good for you, of course. Yeah. I just did one wedding and it was awful. Really? <laughs> But okay. I think I did one too. Yeah, really? Yeah, exactly. Okay. The one of my sister. Okay. So, <laughs> But that's okay. It was okay. It's your sister. Right. <laughs> okay. But you're not only a studio musician or a member of a band, you um you were you were involved in the development of new guitar techniques. Like the tapping technique. Yeah. Um how did the tapping technique come about? Uh well for me it was I was at Musicians Institute, which at that time was just called Guitar Institute of Technology, G I T. That was before mm -hmm. we had bass players, drummers, or anything else. Um, I, I was in the third class they ever had. And uh, every month we would get a seminar by some heavyweight, whether it was Pat Metheny, Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenauer, just all these monsters would come through, Joe Pass. And one month it was Emmett Chapman, and he invented mm -hmm. the Chapman stick, which Tony Levin is probably the most famous stick player that plays yeah, with Peter that. Gabriel and King Crimson. Mm -hmm. And... You know, there, at that time, there was 60 students total, and 59 of us were watching this going, we're just trying to get these six strings down on the guitar. Nobody's going to go out and buy a stick. <laughs> you know, it was a nice seminar, but no thanks. And because it's all tapped, uh, a fellow classmate, Steve Lynch, who ended up in the band Autograph, right. they had a, a big hit with a song called Turn Up the Radio in the 80s. Mm. He started experimenting with with tapping to see what he could do with it and i saw what he was doing you know i check in with him every month and it just blew my mind i thought it was the most exciting thing ever um but there was 
the curriculum, just trying to keep up with the curriculum was too much to do any external things. <clears throat> so I waited till after we graduated and I took a lesson from him. And that's when my whole world opened up. I saw he had this very simple uh, formula for tapping that made sense to me. And I just instantly took to it and then just started experimenting from there. And this was totally parallel to Van Halen. Van Halen yes, was just course. starting to rise in, well, I graduated in 79, so his at least his first record was out at that time. Mm. Um, you know, and eventually I, I dove into Van Halen and Randy Rhodes was tapping at the time and anybody else, uh, eventually Michael Hedges. Um, and it, it was just a really exciting time because uh, not many people were doing it in the beginning. Yeah. And I was just experimenting with doing chord chord voicings that you couldn't physically do with just one hand mm. and, and percussive kind of things. So I was into that. And also there was a teacher named Joe DiOrio who wrote a book called mm. Intervallic Designs. And okay. this involved wide, wide skips. Normally when people play, it's second intervals or third intervals, occasionally a fourth. This is mainly fourths, fifths, sixths, and higher intervals so it's it's very athletic and a lot of string jumping and i memorized his book cover to cover and just really went to town on that too so the, those are two kind of unusual techniques at least very unusual at the time that i, I really got into and uh, developed and uh, with intervallics i uh, eventually did a course with truefire.com um they called uh, they always come up with these wacky names 50 ultra intervallic licks you need to know mm. <laughs> that that's the dvd and they just a couple of weeks ago came out with a book version of that mm -hmm. so um i'm excited about that it's kind of got me fired up again yes wow great okay so let's move a bit to the bad tour because um the bad tour was like the first um time You played with Michael on stage, if I'm if I'm right. Yes. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, so uh, I I've seen an interview a few days ago um, where you were were telling that um, you didn't see Michael for that um, casting. Do you say casting in in English? I think audition. Yeah, audition. audition. Yeah. Audition. We say casting in German. Huh. Um, so um, how did you did you heard about that? Well, it was because of Musicians Institute, because I was teaching there at that time. And they oh. had a referral service because so many people would call up the school looking for players. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at that time, it was guitar, bass and drums and probably keyboards and vocals. They, they've added so much since I graduated. And uh, one of Michael's people called up and said, can you send us two, two prime candidates? And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to get the call. Um, And I canceled everything and bought my first CD player because they were very new in 1987. Yeah. And I just sat down and learned his songs for a couple of days before I went into the audition. And it was really weird. When I went in, there was no band. It was just me and a video camera. Mm -hmm. um, and the only guidance I was given was to play something funky uh, because, you know, I'm known for playing the beaded solo, which is 16 bars in a two and a half hour show. So mm -hmm. most of the show is playing funky rhythm and, and parts from the records. So I grooved on something, and then I just started soloing rock style. Um, I played the Giant Steps. It's a tapping solo that I worked out that ended up on my first record, Above, Blow, and Beyond. And mm -hmm. then I had been playing the Beat It solo for a couple of years in a cover band in Pearl. And... Mm -hmm. um, so I finished with that because I thought, you know, what better <laughs> choice to end with than something that I know he's going to need. And a couple of days later, I got a call that he was interested because somebody videotaped it and he would look at the videos and make notes. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so I got the call and it wasn't like you're hired. It's come down and play with the band and just see how it goes. Okay. And they, they never told me I was hired. I just kept. <laughs> <laughs> kept not getting fired. I kept going. I mean, I worked my ass off. I would I would stay up till two in the morning working on tunes to make sure I got everything really accurate. And then I'd wake up at six for no reason because I was excited as hell. Um, and eventually I had a passport and a ticket to Tokyo. And I thought, hmm, this is looking good. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> and wow. <clears throat> so our our first gigs were in Japan, which was yes. it was surreal. It's so different and so exciting. Um, and, and then he shut down the Tokyo Disneyland so we could hang out for an evening on our own, which was really oh, wild. Great. We saw Captain EO, and we went on the. I mean, usually you have to wait for the ride for half hour or an hour to take a three minute roller coaster ride. And we would just get on right away. And when we were done, they go, well, want to go again? Because nobody else is in line. <laughs> <You know? So laughs> it was really, really fun. And I remember I was in one of the Disneyland shops looking at this um, Daffy Duck, Daisy Duck toothbrush holder where uh-huh. you, you take Daisy's head and you push it down. And the eyes go back and forth for as long as you're supposed to brush your teeth. And I thought it was the most, Whoa, the coolest thing that. ever. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, of course, I bought it. But Cheryl Crow and I, she was singing backgrounds in that. Well, she did a duet with him, too. Mm-hmm. I Just Can't Stop Loving You. And we were both fascinated with this thing. And I didn't know Michael was anywhere near us. And he came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, I really like how you're playing the Beat It solo. And I thought, that's the first, that's the first moment I felt like, this is job security, but, okay. you know, because I didn't know if, uh, you know, I do Japan and then they get somebody else for the next leg of the tour. So <laughs> I, I'll, I'll never forget that moment. It was wonderful. So what did your first meeting with Michael? It was really late. Uh, we had rehearsed for a solid month before okay. I ever met Michael. And at that point, the dancers were in one, one room rehearsing with tracks Singers mm-hmm. were working with tracks, and then the band was in another room. And mm-hmm. I think it was the the first day that we all moved in together to a big rehearsal studio, giant rehearsal studio. Mm-hmm. And his manager, Frank DeLeo, and he walked in. And we had heard that if he was happy with the music, he would be dancing. And mm-hmm. he started dancing right away. You know, he, wow. I can't remember what song he walked in on, but <clears throat> we stopped after the song. And then the people that didn't know him already were introduced to him. And I just remember shaking his hand and looking at him. And he was just radiant, just a gorgeous man mm. and smiling, big, white, perfect teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember uh, where did you um, rehearse for the bad two? Uh Well, the the band originally, I think, was at a rehearsal start studio called Leeds, and then when we oh. when we all came together, it was it was where all the TV productions go, and you know it's it's been twenty years since I've been in LA. Yeah. I can't even remember the area, but I, they were always really late for every single tour. Um, <clears throat> in, in fact, one one tour actually. On the first tour, we started with Japan, and then we reworked the entire show and went back to Japan after a year and a half, uh, after yeah. more hits had been released. Mm-hmm. And because it was booked last minute, there was nothing available in L.A. for us. So we okay. went to Pensacola, Florida, and rehearsed mm-hmm. in a gymnasium. <laughs> I mean, that's <Okay. laughs> you, you couldn't get right. any further away from L.A. than going to Florida. <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> and then there was of one course. tour. I think the history tour it was again. It was so last minute. There was nothing in L.A., and we went out to uh, I want to say Riverside, uh, east of L.A., in into an airplane hangar to Ooh, rehearse, okay. and it was just blistering hot. It was dreadful. Wow, uh, do you remember um, at the rehearsals um, a specific song which was difficult for you to play? No, you know, I I was really, really into jazz and fusion before I got that gig. So as far as the parts, there was nothing that was difficult. But I will say that Mm -hmm. the Beat It solo still kicks my ass after 30 years. (laughs) Okay. You still play that? I I will until I die. People always ask for it. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's challenging. And I kind of fudge a couple things because Van Halen had such a a wide stretch with his fingers that I don't have. So I kind of have to get my right hand in there and do a workaround. Wow. Okay. I got to say, it's very crazy for me to talk to you here because I grew up watching you uh, on tour with Michael all the time on TV. I never, I never saw him live, but 
I grew up with that, so I'm very excited at the moment. Um, so, Tim, you, you can do the next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to ask something to the rehearsals because I wanted how creative could or should the band be? Uh, for example, were you free to design the solos or were there direct guidelines on how to play? You know, on, on a pop show like that where... You know, the audience doesn't even realize it, but they know the EQ of the snare in Billie Jean mm -hmm. because they've heard it so many times yeah. that most most pop tours, the solos are going to be like the record. Um, I was one of the lucky ones because, um, for instance, on a, a tune like Working Day and Night, at mm -hmm. least on the Dangerous Tour, uh, that was a free-for-all. You know, there were there was no set 16 bars It's just go off until Michael felt like it was enough. And then he would, you know, he was kind of egging me on. And then mm -hmm. he would start moving towards the center. And that's when I knew it was time to wrap up. Then he would jump up in the air and then silence. The band would mm -hmm. just stop. So <laughs> that was different every night. I got to improvise on that. But for, for Beat It, there was no way in hell I was going to do anything better than that. And and I already knew the solo and had a lot of respect for it. So I did that every night. Um mm -hmm. I will say there was briefly, we played one song that Slash played on that he had a wrong ass note in there and I wasn't about to duplicate it. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> it, it was like a, a minor third on a major chord or, or yeah. I, even worse of the reverse. So I fixed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've got some fan questions uh, yeah. beside that and Antonia Wenkbeil wants to know, was there a song that you particularly enjoyed performing, your favorite song of an evening? Yeah, Human Nature. Human Oh, it's yeah. my favorite as well, yes. I loved playing that yeah. because he was so magical and mystical. And mm. to look over there, I mean, it's a beautiful song anyway. I love the guitar parts. They're really gorgeous. And to watch his body movements and, of course, his beautiful voice, it was just very ethereal and transformative. And having said that, you know, he, he got the best dancers in L.A. to dance with him. Mm. And yet you see all of them together. And Michael had a certain grace that was above and beyond any of them. Mm. All of them were really great technical skills. They tried to teach me to dance and we soon found that was hopeless. <laughs> wow. But uh, Michael was one of a kind, man, and never to be repeated. Just a force of creativity that will we'll never see again yeah of course i i gotta ask my favorite fan question oh yeah. i know yes yeah, yeah our favorite fans fan question <laughs> it's from baker street boy 2 and watson and they ask what does it look like under the stage <laughs> <laughs> well when you say that <clears throat> i immediately think of when we went to india and the roadies said when they arrived families were living under the stage mm -hmm. <laughs> and okay. snakes Snakes and families. Yeah. All right. I mean, that, that was not the usual understage. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't spend a lot of time understage. I, it, I have a memory of... of uh, At some point, we the band had a trail that I think we went under the stage to get to it. But uh, I don't know. I, I, okay. Yes. <laughs> we thought about that. But what was done backstage before and after the concerts? Were there rituals before playing on stage? Yeah, every night all the performers would get together with Michael and hold hands and there would be a prayer. And uh, Kevin Dorsey, the one of the singers that was the... Yeah. I don't know if you ever had the Twix commercial in Germany, but... No. Okay. Well, but I know him. Okay. Well, he, he was the low voice of the the mm -hmm. choir, the background singers. And he he was on a session one time and was just goofing around and said, oh, yeah. I mean, really low. <laughs> and they sampled oh, that. I remember that. Yeah, okay. Well, I remember that. It's really famous. They, they took it without his permission and put it in a commercial. So I, I think okay. he got some <laughs> change after the fact. So Kevin would, um, after the prayer, he would quote James Brown and say and whatsoever we play 
It's got to be funky. I think all of us would join <laughs> in on that. Yeah. It's got to be funky. And that so would Michael always... was with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that would okay. always make him giggle. And, and then next time we saw him, he was on stage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask um, a question from the Galaf. And he was asking, um, what does a typical day on tour um, look like? Well, I, I'll say, I'll start with Japan because that's where we first started. Mm -hmm. Because Japan is so reliant on trains, uh, the mm -hmm. shows were kind of early. I, I think like seven o'clock at night, maybe 6.30. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had to have my hair and makeup done starting at seven. So I would wow. get up really early and it took two and a half hours to get me looking like that. And I would go back to bed <laughs> and, and I'd wake up an hour or two later and look exactly the same. Like there was so much hairspray in my hair. I mean, you could yeah. push it down to my head and it would just pop back up. Um, so at, at some point, and it was usually early, so we wouldn't get stuck in traffic. We would go to the venue. We were there hours and hours early to do mm -hmm. a sound check. We'd have dinner there um, and a lot of hangout time. And, um, It really depended on the venue, what happened after the show. Generally, I can't remember what songs we played, what tours, but uh, sometimes we would end with Man in the Mirror. And the okay. band would still mm -hmm. be playing after Michael left the stage. And he yes. would be in a van and he would be out, just mm. gone before we played the last note, which was the safe thing to do. Yeah. But, was uh, Michael... Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, a lot of times the band would just have to hang out for an hour or more uh, mm -hmm. to wait for the audience to leave if there was an alternate route to get out. Yeah. Was Michael with the band in contact away from the stage? Or did you meet him just on stage? Well, there were 100 people in the entourage. Mm -hmm. So we took up three different hotels. It was Michael and the security and his wardrobe guy. I think he was there. Um, then the performers... Uh, makeup artists, dancers in another hotel. Then the roadies w were in another hotel. Um, so with there was an exception of one or two times when we were in the same hotel as Michael. And I thought we'd be hanging out. You know, I was kind of bummed that we weren't in the same hotel to hang out after shows. But mm -hmm. when we were in the same hotel, it was a drag because there would be fans singing Billie Jean outside his window at three o'clock in the morning. They, they would <laughs> yeah. be there all night. And whenever any of us left the hotel, they would follow us. They would go mm. into bookstores, into restaurants. And so we got a taste of what he went through and no thanks. Um, yeah. So when we okay. did hang, it was well planned in advance. Like when we went to the Tokyo Disneyland, we all knew yeah. that was coming for days um, often when we were touring, we would be out during American holidays, like Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And so we were in Australia, I think, on the bad tour. No, that was the history tour. Um, and he had a, a big dinner in a big hall for all of us to celebrate Thanksgiving on that day off. And he loved amusement parks. There, there was one in Germany, I remember, at least once we went to. where mm, um, Fantasialand. Yeah, I think he shut yes. that down so we could hang mm -hmm. out without being bothered so it, it wasn't as much hanging out as i would have liked but i was very appreciative of the efforts that he did put in to to get together yes of course i think so <laughs> i want to know something yeah and we didn't talk about that before uh, tim and i okay. didn't talk about that before but uh, i remember there was one moment on the dangerous tour um it was a show in oslo 1992 And it was a daylight show. It was complete until the end of the show. It was still daylight. So um, usually you had, for the beaded solo, you had some some laser um, <laughs> yeah. with you. Yeah. But on that show, you had some some different uh, thing. You had like a, like a giant snake or dragon, something like that on your shoulders. I I'm not sure if it was different from this, the thing you ha had when it was dark but i always was wondering wasn't that heavy i mean yes. I, i was wondering how could you still play the the beaded solo with that 
giant thing on your yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing that that was a dragon and that was a total pain in the ass and it was so heavy wow. that <laughs> people said you look really unhappy <laughs> okay and i was i mean it, it felt like my back was gonna break and okay we didn't use that for very long and luckily they had a plan b which was like viking horns or something of yes. antlers yes that they put on that was super lightweight and um all of that stuff had fiber optic laser lights in it, but you just mm. couldn't see it when it was yes. light out. In fact, I remember being in Sweden in late July and waking up mm. from jet lag and, you know, three o'clock in the yeah. morning, it's daylight. It blew my mind. I'd never experienced that before. Scandinavia, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a say in your outfits? Yes. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the beginning... Well, he hired painters to, to just draw up looks for every performer to, to come up with costumes. And then they would get customers to measure and make them come alive. Mm. Um, the, only, the only input that I had for the first round was they asked if I was okay with wearing high heels. And I said, oh, hell no, I'll kill myself. <laughs> and so for all of the tours, I had flat heels, which I was really appreciative of. Mm -hmm. And I remember Cheryl Crow wore high heels and she got them caught in the grating one time and damn near did a face plant. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then for the history tour, somebody had given Michael a, a painting book of an airbrushed images that were S&M, sadomasochistic. And, okay. you know, there was the images were beautiful, but he had chosen a look for me from that. And that's how I ended up with that. Leather face yes, mask and leather that. over the nose and yes. under the chin. Was it on the history tour? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, I remember that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, did, did you have a favorite tour? I mean, which of, of those three tours, which one was your favorite? It was definitely the bad tour because everything was super new and super exciting. It's the first time I got outside of America, except for Mexico. So mm. to get to see the whole world and get paid well for it, um, I was already a fan of his music anyway. So mm. it was such a joy to be part of it. And all of the players were great people. And the mm. ones that are still alive, we, we still stay in touch. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah, the Bad Tour is definitely, I think, um, the favorite tour of most of the fans. Yeah. And that's because uh, it was very live, everything. And uh, I think you had also a lot more solo stuff going on on the on the bad tour, if I'm correct, because um, I'm very into all the concerts from Michael, and the bad tour had like your solo on Heartbreak Hotel. Oh. It had the beaded solo, of course. It had at the end of the concert, it had um, the solo on Bad even, and Band so jam. on. I think, yeah, in comparison to the history tour, for example, it was very different but I, i i i love every tour but um this one was my favorite mm. as well yeah so i'm glad you know, you, i'm glad it was yours too yeah that <laughs> bad was great and and dangerous and history just kind of blend together in my memory i can't remember what songs we played when in fact i've done i've done a i don't know half a dozen tribute shows and people will say let's let's play ds or let's play this or that and i'll say we never played that live and they go Yes, you did. I, I have this film from July 27th in Stockholm. <laughs> I go, oh, well, so much for my memory. Yes, fans, of course. <laughs> Remember every concert. But I think I'm one of those fans, actually. Yes, you yeah. are. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, no, it's no problem with me. Um, but in addition to the tour life, there were also events such like the Moonwalker shoot or, of course, Super Bowl. Um, will that become routine at some point? Um, to play actually, such big events, kind of, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't like, ugh, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but it's the same set in the same order every night, and always stadiums when okay. we were not in America. America's the only place that we did arenas because it was in the winter time and it would have been cold and rainy. <clears throat> and so instead of doing one stadium, we would do three nights in a 20,000-seater mm. arena. But I, I, I joke with people because we got we only played two or three days a week, which mm. was luxury because most bands, it's so expensive to keep a, a 
troop of people on the road that, you know, if you're not playing, you're moving to the next venue because mm. uh, you got to keep that money coming in to pay all, all the expenses. Well, Michael had reached a point in his career where he didn't have to do that. He did two or three days a week. Um, you know, it take the crew quite a while to build the stage. And and so as a result, we got lots of time to see where we were at, which is really unusual. We, oh, I remember when we first landed in Europe, it was in Rome. And so we took a day to go to the Forum. Another day we went to the Colosseum. We really got to see the place. And so it was, mm. it was a paid vacation for me. Okay. Is there like one of these events um which didn't happen on tour um like on tv sh tv shows or something or like tim said a super bowl is there some event you remember like the most i mean maybe one of your favorites yeah the super bowl was super super oh. exciting you know because it, it was it was only ever going to happen once it was going out to mm -hmm. a billion and a half people which was the biggest audience in television history which i didn't know at the time that we did it but i knew A lot of people were going to see it. And that's the only time I ever felt like he was nervous because there's so much okay. pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. if something went wrong, there's no fixing it. <laughs> and, yeah, and in fact, he, True. you can see part of that performance where the two of us are in one corner of the stage and the guy that did the fog outdoors, you just kind of have to gauge the wind. And there's one point where you can't see any either of us because there's so yeah, much fog. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yes, <laughs> I remember that. Yes, you were hidden in it. I remember yeah. too, of course. You signed uh, the Super Bowl uh, pick with you and Michael when I met you here in my hometown. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Oh. <laughs> you signed yeah. everything. You signed me posters and CDs. That was so great. And I never would sell something like that. I wanted, if you uh, if you ask yourself, okay, that's for eBay. That's for eBay too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I won't do that. No, it's just for me. Um, let's get Back? No, we won't get back. But you talked about rehearsals. And I think the dangerous rehearsals were on Neverland Ranch. Is that right? No, I've never been to Neverland. Okay, I thought so. I think some of those rehearsals were on Neverland. Okay. But um, uh, I think I've seen some video stuff where um, it was without the guitar. So, um, yeah. but where did they actually, uh, where did you actually rehearse for the dangerous tour? Oh, I, I don't remember. There, there's one rehearsal st studio called Leeds that that we did. Oh, okay. um, as far mm -hmm. as the big rehearsal studios with with everybody, I, you know, okay. they, they typically are a big complex of TV mm -hmm. studios. Um, and okay. I know it was not in Hollywood; it was south of Hollywood. Do you remember when was your last collaboration with Michael? Yeah, uh, it was the History Tour. And, you know, th that was kind of a disappointment at the end of every tour. Um, you would hope that there would be a big party with everybody. Hmm. But the roadies were busy putting everything away, getting ready to ship. And, uh, you know, maybe a few of us, maybe just the band partied together. And hmm. we would get a, a message from Michael thanking us and um, sayonara. You know, that was okay. it. It was always, it's, you know, you're you're amped for the whole tour and, ah, we're going here, we're going there. And when it comes to the end, it's it's like, ah, uh, you know, I'm going to go home and nobody's going to knock on my door and make my mm. bed and put chocolate on the pillow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I think, yes. Yeah, it's hard to come down. Yes, I know. Even if you're playing uh, such stadiums every night, as you said, because, you know, uh, two or three weeks a night. Um A week, two or three nights a week. So yeah. <laughs> I think now it's right. <laughs> Do you have any memorabilia from that time? Would you consider yourself a collector? <laughs> you know, I did collect a lot of stuff and I've gotten rid of it because it's it just collects dust. You know, mm -hmm. I at the end of the bad tour, they tried to sell us our costumes and nobody was buying. <laughs> and so, okay. And so they just gave it to us. So I, I got the laser headdress and several costumes. And they just hung out in my closet for years. And I go, I'm never going to wear this anywhere. Um, and so I sold some stuff to the Hard Rock. And then the, there was another uh, another auction of some sort that I got rid of more stuff. But I have plenty of scrapbooks, you know, especially on the bad tour. I would go out looking for reviews after every show. 
Yeah. And I ended up with so many magazines. It was so heavy, just ridiculous. Um, but uh, the scrapbooks, the personal scrapbooks, and, you know, this is before smartphones, so we had our Instamatic cameras or whatever, yeah. and I have a lot of really shitty photos of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I would love to see them, of course. But that's well, you know, I, I did, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, I started digging into the scrapbooks, and I have a series on my YouTube channel called K, so there's one time, okay, and it's 10 minutes of stories and showing photos from okay. the scrapbooks. So there, right. there's some Michael stuff there that you might enjoy. Yeah. So I've seen that yesterday, that. actually. I think I've seen that yesterday a bit. Yeah. And yeah, but I w I have some uh, more fan question here. Okay. Um, and I remember when this is it came. I mean, when I saw like the trailer and everything, I was a bit disappointed because I I was like, who's that guitarist there? Yeah, because we would I was all have loved expecting to see you very there. much. Yes, um, I was kind of disappointed. Uh, Me too. Would, um, did they ever ask you? Um, to play in on the new concerts back then in 2009? You know, that whole thing was a super clusterfuck. And I think <clears throat> I think a lot of stuff was going on that did not get Michael's approval. Hmm. Um, All right. I know for sure, not, not the band members necessarily, but I know for sure there were people involved in the tour that he didn't want there. And other people mm -hmm. were taking control and hiring people and... You know, he just wasn't as much a part of it as he should have been. Um, I did I did get the word out that I was interested. I, I know mm -hmm. that got to the right people. But in the end, you know, I, I understand, especially for the dancers, he wanted young people. He wanted people mm -hmm. in their 20s because those dances are not easy, right? Mm. <laughs> it yes, takes yes, a okay. lot of energy. And it made sense to have a, a younger me, so to speak, in in my place in fact it's so funny somebody came up to me after this as it came out and wanted me to sign the poster of mm. orianthi okay and i i just looked at him and go yeah okay <laughs> really I, you did they, that they, they don't know the difference then okay. there you go oh my god yeah I, I i mean it's funny because we both had blonde hair that people think we were the same and i go don't you think that 1987 <laughs> and how many ever years that I might look a little older, you know. <laughs> But okay. power to her, man. I, I was, you know, in the in the end, I was really happy for her, and it was time to pass the baton. I had done 10 years with him, um, and is what it is. And honestly, if I had gotten that gig, I would have spent a shitload of money on new equipment that I couldn't pay for. Okay. Because everything mm -hmm. exploded. Yes. Okay. Let's talk <clears throat> about your career since the beginning of the 90s. And you have also published solo albums on which you can admire the many facets of your instrumental playing. Um, did you yourself have the creative freedom there, which may have been missing sometimes before? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every everything that you got hired for, you really have to have a perspective on why you're there. Mm. When I played... With Michael, I was there to play a part. Um, it was part theatrical, especially that's how I justified that that costume on the history tour. I go, okay, this is way beyond music because mm. Michael would take music as the base to build a show on. Then he'd put lasers, videos, costumes, um, you know, special arrangements, dancers, and all this stuff to entertain people. Mm. And I realized I was a, a character at that point, especially with that horrible mask. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I totally had a brain fart again. What was the question? <laughs> uh, we talked about your solo albums and solo, the creative yeah. freedom. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, you know, when I'm on my own, um, although I'm a still I'm a big fan of Michael's music, my heart as a guitar player is more towards Jeff Beck, yeah, who I, I, I got to play with after. And that's where my instrumental guitar voice is as well. So when I started doing uh, guitar records and solo records, it was definitely not pop. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I don't sing. I really don't sing well, so I don't bother. So the guitar is my voice. So the, the guitar is going to be playing the melodies. And I think Jeff Beck influenced you uh, with electronical music. Am I right? Yeah. It's funny because people... 
people that don't like that era um, blame it on me. Like I got him into the modern age and it was exactly the opposite. Yeah, I, I heard about it. <laughs> I wasn't listening to that stuff at all. And he turned, yeah. turned me on to the prodigy, crystal method and stuff like that. And I really took to it and mm. really dug deep into it. And I'm still into it. So, I mean, and that's, you know, uh, my last record, which is called Whatever, it's all songs I wrote for Jeff, except for one. And okay. it's very electronic influence. And to see the behind the scenes of how he made the You Had It Coming record, <clears throat> it was really fascinating because there was one room with a really great drum programmer. And he would come up with these badass grooves. He would send it across the hallway to the uh, producer who was with Jeff. And the producer was so quick at hearing sections and being able to toss a, a backdrop down there. And mm. and then he would just have Jeff react to it. Jeff improv all of it. And he's such a melodic player that Andy Wright, the producer, would just cut it up and go, okay, this is the verse, this is the chorus, yeah. and that's the solo. And he was working with Pro Tools, and that's the first I had experienced digital recording. Mm. And so I took my Jeff Beck money and got myself a Pro Tools system, which... It was a ridiculous amount of money. Ridiculous. Okay. Especially because now you have the pretty much the, the same horsepower in your smartphone to record. Yeah. You know? True. Isn't that amazing? True. Yes. <laughs> I wonder every time. Uh, so where can you be seen right now? If you want, well, uh, if we want to see you live. Yeah. Um, you know, because of COVID, it's, it's really difficult. I just... Came back from a, a two-week tour with Navi doing a, a Jackson yeah. tribute. Yeah, I've been with them four or five years, and um, I was supposed to go back next year. I've got some offers, but you never know with COVID. Um, mm. I started a cover band at home a couple of years ago because I'm really tired of touring. Uh, the whole flight yeah. thing, I'm just broken guitars, misconnections. It's so stressful. I don't want to do it anymore. So... I started my cover band. We we just did two shows last weekend, but then in October, the shows are canceled again because of COVID because people mm. refuse to get vaccinated. And so it keeps spreading and spreading and they, they're shutting down indoor venues. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen over the, the winter. It's it's super frustrating for musicians. Yes, it is. But you're still working on, on some projects like the Guitar Symposium? Yeah, I, uh, I, I launched... The Guitar Cloud Symposium dot com. I launched last um, August, and we did something every month. We had all kinds of different great players come through teaching, and it's it's a lot of work behind the scenes because I'm the mm. only one doing stuff, you know. <laughs> so um, <laughs> now the plan is to do it four times a year and um, launch a store that's going to have archives of what we taught. Okay, and, yeah, that's and great. Just, Slow it down a little bit. I've I've got sessions that I do at home as well. A um, little bit of everything. I mean, most musicians do, especially now during COVID. Mm. You know, so many tours are canceled and then they're booked and canceled again. So um, if anybody wants me on their record, hit me up. Uh, yes. I'm easy to get to through jenniferbatten.com. That's right. Um, I've got one fan club question. Kai, yeah. I don't know if you wanted to ask that. Um, are, are you talking about the last one? Yes, from Jenny from yes. the German Malibu fan club. Yes, yes, I, I was about to say okay. that. Um, she did ask. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm. I mean, I'm sure you know that. For example, Brad Sundberg has his um, his. I think he he calls it seminar where he does, uh, like telling stories about Michael Jackson, showing like his work stuff he In did. Studio I with think MJ. it's called. Yes, in the mm -hmm. studio with MJ. Uh, are there any plans for stuff like that, like similar fan events, something like that? Well, you know what? The, the next Guitar Cloud Symposium is actually going to be a singer-songwriter summit, and Saida Garrett is going to be our special guest. So people will have the opportunity to ask her questions about anything. Um, and she's so prolific. I, I hadn't talked to her in years. Um, we toured the history tour together, and she was a delight. So, such a funny character and so talented. So that's happening. And I do have vague plans to do a Michael Jackson day for guitar players to, to teach all the songs that we did on, on the tours, starting with the, the simplest parts. 
Um, it, it's not going to be elaborate reworking of Billie Jean for solo guitar with tapping and all that stuff. I, I want it to be simple enough that, that people that haven't been playing that long can learn stuff and play along with the records. Because mm. that's, that's what most people do anyway. Most people do not want to be professional musicians, which is really mm. smart. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. know, I mean, the whole idea of music is to have fun with it and yes, if you're getting right. your ass whipped yes. out there in the road it's it's like eh, it, it can it can remove some of the excitement yeah you're right that's the reason why i won't do that professional of course <laughs> good for you Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, so I think we're nearly at the end of our conversation. Um, okay. Yes. So um, I have to once again thank you so much for that meeting today. Sure. Um, how late is it now uh, at, at, at your clock? It's 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Okay. So at us it's 10 Um No, 10 p.m.? Is it p.m.? Yes. We don't yes. have that uh, that p.m. a.m. stuff in Germany. It's just... Oh, um, so it's 22 for you. Yes, it's 22 yes. for me. Yeah, that's right. That's smarter. <laughs> yes, that's so baby. much smarter. I, I tell you what, <laughs> man. I can't tell you how many times I, I have missed the uh, the alarm clock because it was set for 7 p.m. instead of a.m. Yeah, I have and to so, Google it every day. <laughs> when I, I, have to... I switched to military time a long time ago just to save my ass for travel okay yes yeah <laughs> that's better so it's time to say goodbye for us um Jeez. kai do you have <laughs> do you have any question kai oh i'm so i'm still so excited Did we miss something? i just i just want to say <laughs> I, i just want to say thank you so much for talking to us for taking um the time and sure. it's pretty pretty amazing uh and i feel like Like I'm seven years old now because uh, <laughs> I've seen all that stuff back then. I was 12. Um, so thanks so much. And um, I think we would like to let you have the last words. Yes, of oh, course. We'll do the plugs. <laughs> I have three CDs available at jenniferbatten.com. Um, and uh, oh, for, for any guitar players, I, I have three courses available on truefire.com. One is on rock soloing, one is rhythm guitar, and one is intervallics. And then the new intervallic designs, uh, that f no, ultra intervallic. So I don't even know the title of the book. Just <laughs> please check this out. <laughs> we will put that. We will put that in the in all the descriptions and the videos descriptions and everything, so people can find it. Yes, of course we will. Yeah, put put something that says Jennifer doesn't even know what the name of her book is. <laughs> <laughs> that's no problem <laughs> but um as far as we'll dates, link it. whenever i get to tour uh I, i've been asked to tour february march but it's you know the details are not in place so i, I don't put anything on the site until it's confirmed um but everything will be at jenniferbatten.com when it is confirmed and you can see what i'm up to and then i got i have a ridiculous number of facebook pages uh, i have my <laughs> own i have jennifer batten music That's that's where anything international will be posted also. And I have an Instagram page and also pages for Guitar Cloud Symposium. So um, that's why I'm so scattered. I got too much going on. <laughs> we'll speak about that later, of course. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> okay. So then we have to say goodbye. Okay. Yes. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> 